Hello, and welcome to the New Writing North Showcase for BBC Words First. I'm Nadine Aisha Jasset, and it's been my absolute pleasure to work with the 16 participants that you're about to witness work from tonight. I've worked with them intensively, and each week it has brought me so much joy. They are intelligent, they are wise, they are brave, they are bold, and above all, of course, they are poets and spoken word artists who are sharing their words with you, with me, and with themselves. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this, and I can't wait to share the work from our 16 participants with you. They're wonderful, and they are do doing and going to do great, great things. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Maybe sticks and stones break bones, but words hurt too. Staining my minds like ink as they seep through and pollute every thought. Tainted. To the boy I sat next to in year eight. I wonder if you understood the weight of your words when you looked at me and decided my worth. Based on your expectation of thick thighs and curves, you said to me, smiling obliviously. You're so skinny. Do you even eat? As you fed on the laughs and approval of your peers, they jeered, not knowing that these shallow words would fill me for years. Tell me, who decided on the ideal? When body types go in and out of style like t-shirts. But a t-shirt you can change. I can decide that I don't like it and discard it in a day, but my legs, my arms, my waist, that stays the same, yet you continue to blame me for not fitting your ideal. Reminded of this at every function I attend where I hear, hmm, huh, you've gained. Yes, auntie, I've gained. Confidence in a body which once brought me shame, I've gained. Learning to appreciate what I cannot change, I've gained. No longer carrying the weight of your disapproval. I let go. Of an ideal rooted in comparison. A false sense of hierarchy driven by a fleeting appearance. It isn't real. My molars scrunch Barbie's head, rending her face with wrinkles, but her bright pink smile sour. I spit her out. Wet cana cologne hair. Lick her headless PVC body, Sede Myogen gifts to his platoon of football boys. Her rubber legs are half eaten chicken wings on my concrete dinner plate. I chew at her feet to their factory form, boot her body into the bins more. I crunch the football's left side head, digging my canines into his rotten face, but he doesn't deflate. I spit him out. Wet polyurethane flesh slides down his half grey sphere body. Ruth Handler gifts to her troops of Barbie girls. I munch on his hexagonal patterns on the Mattel conifer lawn, use my mangled hands to hurl his body into the pond's cesspool. Inside, the aftermath lingers. The father finds a Barbie football player doll in between the sofa cushions and says to her, I wish I understood you. 
The sun sits on top of the stairs, grinding chunks of a pink foam football, holding his maimed body in his tiny leaf palms and says, I wish you understood me. In this no man's land, the football swallows a brutal wind. The father digests his gnawing on love for his son. Sometimes our journey is accompanied by major chords. The grand piano singing in forte as we watch a game in the family room. Mum with a cadenza cooking on a happy note. Sometimes abrupt scatting enters the sheet music of our play and the improv of minor notes dominates. So we dust off the violin and the crescendo of pain and hardship sinks in. First, my sister's health, then my brother's freedom. A glissando from situation to situation. This season has selected rock and roll, rocking our foundation and watching our heads roll. As the family slowly begins to play as an arpeggio, until we reach a more bearable tempo, our notes played sound legato, becoming as one over our shared root note, back as one accord. The peaks and troughs of the EQ, the many downloads and uploads of the song that narrates the journey, all in wave format screaming at decibels too high no one can hear over the threshold that would ring their ears and bring alarm so we're each trapped and stuck on a note behind four bars waiting for our song to be shuffled in the mix and release us free to share this story our symphony of sounds, once the backdrop to crashing symbols, now the opening to voices of comfort that soothes the soul, reminiscent of the days we sat round the piano together, one family. Guru back in Delhi taught me to double the speed. Since I was doing too good in my skin, I jumped both that year in my fears, but never a single beat. I had to ensure my bells are tied. I take walk to make the audience is tied. Everything on stage was set up place because all I had to be was the fire in me. And then everything in my life was four times the speed. My dreams knocked on my door, but they also knocked me off my feet. I came to a white country to be a part of a different breed, a breed that would frown upon anything that was brown. My dancing bells, my not so thick skin. Chai, tea, latte, chai and tea are the fucking same thing. I was chasing my dreams but on new streets, shrinking within yet wanting to be seen, dancing the story of who I have been. I was dreaming in my own language and they didn't know what it means. And that's when I began losing my rhythm. 
the coldness of this country began to freeze my knees it seemed to be extinguishing the fire in me the dreams that were supposed to set me free began choking me instead and that's when i began losing my breath my counselor a kind white man asked me to stop wanting to be seen he told me to practice box breathing whenever my heart felt like it was burning count to 16 one two inhale five six exhale nine ten inhale thirteen fourteen exhale i now dream without an accent dance without beats living in these smoked up boxes i'm learning again how to breathe. At a poetry reading, the mid to late twenties man in a black turtleneck marks the midpoint of his poem with, which is to say. But all I hear is, which is to say. And suddenly Macbeth and Banquo are sitting in the front row, having their last interaction before their futures are determined for them. I hear wishes, hooray, and suddenly I have found not one but two eyelashes on your cheek that I get to gently place in your hair for you to make a cheeky wish, hopefully involving me. I hear withers away. And suddenly it's five days after I bought you flowers and I wish they could stay vibrant forever. but. Nothing stays in time like that. Apart, of course, from the mid to late twenties man in a black turtleneck at the poetry reading who ends his poem with Without you, I am a blank page, never to be written on. Which receives a polite round of applause, of course, but as your amused eyes find mine, I'm annoyed at how much I agree with him. Which annoyingly is to say that I wish for you and I to be like Macbeth and Banquo. Not in the sense that we'd both die, but that would be remembered forever. In service of a quiet life, we found a dead frog on the street, wrapped it in newspaper and buried it in the bin. It's so strange. You said, we're so far from water, but a lot can be done in service of a quiet life. The Truth sits on the six o'clock news in a nice suit, hand wringing over blue bins and bottle tops. When a man in a tight tie speaks, a flood becomes folklore, an ankle deep panic, an empty wave for votes, those swept away get swept under a rug. A hot February is understood through a joke at a bus stop. A lonely politician wins a war. His wife packs the second best suitcase. If you don't look both ways before you cross the road, you'll get hit by a car, so... What happens here, then? A crisp packet sits on the same hillside for centuries. It's okay, I think. I can still sell my house to a mermaid or a hermit crab. A protester dies in police custody. A fox catches a rabbit. A rabbit dies. Would the story be any different if this was a wolf or a bear? Feminist sweatshop t-shirts are putting flies into the same spider's web. In the forest, I put my ear to the bell of a daffodil. And I swear it rings like an alarm. If you watch Netflix for two hours, you could have driven to Dundee in more ways than one. We should really ask the man who sells oil about this for his unbiased opinion. Cows sit down before it rains. Do they know what's coming? 
Headlines condemn a smashed window at a rally and not the broken promise behind the hammer. I walk down to the sea, wade in until I'm knee deep. Just give it time, I think. So soon this same spot will drown me. Jump. I am stood on the edge of a platform. Trains going in a familiar direction. Same destination as always. Backwards, forwards, falling, drifting. Life for us are compliments of Tinder dates no longer hold me up. I've forgotten what it feels to mean enough of anything. Running, that's something that never worked out. Doubt, depression, intrusive thoughts, abandonment issues make their home in my head. There's no escape from that. And I find it rude. Yeah, they don't even pay rent. I went home with something that I've never had. Left aromas, they've tied nooses around my neck. Tighter, fighting every time that I take a step is my next eviction notice. To a world that I am already dead to. As it's not me who's running away from the world. The world is running away from me at speed. And silence is the biggest killer of humanity. My toes trace the edges of the platform like they are ready to dance. Mania, minor child. <laughs> She is mother god's sister, who rides furiously through the crowded dark days of a body she no longer belongs to, skin crackling at the seams. She is still age free, it seems. A hopeful child waiting for her mum to come home, that happy hope never lasts. Society thinks she is madness wrapped up in cotton wool. Doesn't know what a punch feels like, but she will. Tomorrow. Will not come for me, for I am just existing on... Borrow time, lightning, shackling my bones, treading on the eggshells of mine, the gap drum through the concrete jump and suddenly it's like all my memories flood back to me it's like they know they'll never have the chance to bloom again the way my mum's smile looked at me the dent in her cheek when her eyebrows raised smashing gravy for tea all the people who abused me in the name of love and blood when that week in year six we went to Sutherland Lodge and I wrote all the list of the girls I wanted to share a room with the pretty girls how did I not know my glorious bittersweet destiny of love with women or the women who felt to love me how kids failed to understand how all the words I spoke were mumbled, how broken jewels and scrubbed my face with what I did, how men linger in the corner of every story even when it didn't involve them. The sweet tickling remains on my lips from someone who desired my body more than I ever could. How my voice is an echo chamber, ears never wanted to hear, how I'm already bleeding, but you can't see me, can't see a trace, memories erased from my DNA because none of that matters anymore. And that is fucking liberating. This is freedom. I am okay now. I am finally in the driving seat, steering down my own destiny, the sound of my favourite night train as Joram through the concrete jump. They will see me now, in the smiles you get from strangers. You will see me now. Some of us cry about our mothers and then spritz on another layer of Charlie Red. We spin into a paste on the roundabout drip from the seats like stalactites which the others snap off and eat like Skegness rock. Empty cans thrown overhead are rockets we try to straddle but miss. Instead, we straddle our lovers. In bushes, up banks, in cars, curled over the steering wheel or a bench or a bin. <laughs> we hold ourselves up spread our cheeks and let the boys in, wet with the stickiness of the day and nothing else. <laughs> the mud of the football field is littered with the last burning butts of a million cigarettes. It's as if all the stars have fallen and we're standing on them in trainers. <laughs> and each of us bear things. Me, a grudge against the boy who promised me the condom in his sock, but later stretched it over his head and blew it up through his nostrils. Now he's floated to the telephone lines and there's a crowd of people balanced on each other's shoulders to try and bring him back down. <laughs> Origami swans folded from Rizzler's walk the park. We have the boys piss in a nearby ditch so they have a pond to swim in and admire the things we can bring to life. The night backs away from us, turns its face as the last cigarette burns out. 
We threaten, please don't go, I'll eat you whole, and scramble towards the black. The field blooms with crawling girls, knees caked with ash and mud, reaching for the corners of the knight's coat. Some of them think they found the pocket, climb inside and promise to sleep. Others use hair grips to try and stab it down in its tracks, pin it to the soil, spread it out like a tent floor. The crying starts. Echoes bounce between the trees and then the coat slips to a single thread across the horizon. The hard slap of morning shuts our mouths. These aren't just stretch marks. These are souvenirs. I give the biggest thanks, cheers to that journey I went on. These are reminders of the tears and the tears, the tiredness, the contractions, the crowning like spears, stabbing at my most tender places. My beautiful baby left his mark, left these traces. These aren't just stretch marks. These are so much more, my dear. These are tiny trophies for bossing it through a pain so shocking and severe for how my body levelled up and powerfully switched gears, housed a whole healthy human for the most part of a year, my initiation into womanhood, motherhood. And I see that crystal clear. These stripes tell a story on my skin. These lines are a symbol of my biggest win. These marks ain't ugly. No, no way near. These are certificates of congratulations for conquering my fears and I prayed so hard against these before but I love and appreciate my baby and my body so I can't help but smile from ear to ear. My stretch marks ain't a horror. I wear them all with honour because no matter how loud and piercing the screams during labour that you hear, that's the very least of it. It's so much more than it appears. It's mad but I made it, slayed it full-time mummy the best ever career my body ain't wrecked these are my rewards this is my decoration how my body records its achievements my body ain't doomed these are sacred tattoos my beautiful baby's signature on the area that he stewed before he came out the oven so i have to love him <clears throat> my body could never be destroyed sweetie these are my very own precious and permanent graffiti, proof of my pregnancy and how my baby was bursting to get out and meet me. My body ain't a pity. <laughs> These are personalised, unique and so pretty. I am a woman and I gave birth. I'm so powerful. I placed another human being on this earth. I did that and that's my worth. So these aren't just stretch marks. These are souvenirs. I give the biggest thanks, cheers to that journey I went on. These aren't just stretch marks. These are extra special souvenirs. I give the biggest thanks, cheers to that journey I went on. You put me to work like the perk of smelling leather might make my bruises better, the noise of the machine softening the edges over the girl with legs over hedges. The bell of the door rings as before, the doctor who told me to take responsibility for future atrocities like my trauma is a gift, end of shift lights out. You ask me if I want McDonald's to see the night out. You fuss over me, we discuss winning the lottery, the shock for me of having to bring myself to the hell of telling you. You order a number two, your usual cappuccino with casino card. You've collected your stamps, I trample the dream of a loyalty scheme for sexual assault. Fourth time, it is their fault. Fifth, they might do time. You shine up the brogues of the customers who lightly brush over and say, who's this young lady? But you save me, throw them out in the street, give the neighbours something to talk about over their meat loafers. You boast, I know you've broken bones. I watch you snap the stilettos with no regrets, knife in hand, Google reviews you a no bullshit man. How do I dust down my fear? You could make him disappear. Trim years off this guy. I fix on my fries, wishing I was in the car seat saying my first words of your name. No shame. 
You put me in the car when I couldn't rest. You still do, I guess. You scalpel at my skin in attempts to get in. I slam and ran to him, lied I was at Tamsin's house. The doubt you had was dressed in camo. The ammo under your bed went rusty. Trust me, Dad, it's only a scratch. You scream foul at the match. I sneak behind you and limp up the stairs. The indent of your fingernails still in the chair, banging on the bathroom door, asking if I need help. Laying in a crimson tub, wishing I could melt. Like the, the wax you use to seal the stitching of the shoe. I'd give my truth to hear you double loop and through, tie my laces so I could run faster and outrun my master. There she goes, bonnie lass, ten years of lapse. You wrap me up and I work up the courage to rummage my brain, driving down country lanes to tell you. Spell it out for you. I need insoles to tell my story. You hold me in despair. The man who could fix everything, I am the one he couldn't repair. Writing therapy. I had a corset on my chest. Every day the devil would slither out the depths of hell and pull it, stretch it and tighten it, leaving just enough space for me to breathe before he tied a pretty bow with the lace. I couldn't breathe. Deep breaths didn't feel so deep anymore and my heart would drop to the floor at the thought of dying aged 15. I glugged and glugged on water as if the molecules would form a hand and fix me internally. As if the water would loosen the bow the devil had tied so tightly. As if tomorrow things would be different. The doctor said you're okay, Maya, but you're not. The x-ray came back fine, but then why do you feel like this? Why do you feel like your chest is compressed and every day you may take your last breath? Why did the x-ray come back fine? Is it your head? Is it all in your mind? The doctor said it looked like you were trying to find anything to blame on the chest pains apart from anxiety. And the lace loosened. That's when it occurred to me that my body was healthy but my mind was decaying. That I dismissed the feeling until it sat on my chest and dragged me into an accident and emergency room. That's when I realised I had anxiety. And that's when God came with a pen and paper and handed it to me. That's when God gave me one thing to keep me off the verge of insanity. That's when God gave me the ability to write poetry. Stones. When shame is etched onto your skin, your weeks, months, years, and you become invisible, a sin. When you carry an entire tribe's honour on your shoulders, in your bones. When you are dismissed mid-sentence, the pulse of your voice becomes air and their lies become your truth. When grief lines your face in places most people don't have lines and your hands become temples. When the brisk summer air blows through your veil and your body is erect in rusty red earth. When you are still alive, buried six feet in and you pray in a language you do not understand. When you call on Allah and his prophets Muhammad and Isa, then your mother, but your cries only touch the clouds. When the men become God and close the doors of repentance on earth, their hands filled with stones, their hearts made of stone. When you hold your breath in your lungs and your nails cut into your palms until the first stone hits. When the blood has dried within your veins and your body becomes a lesson and food for the crows. When the sea embraces you beneath its skin and you wash up on nameless shores in a suitcase. When the hours breathe like poppies, the moon is born in the east but weeps for you in the west. When you dreamed of peace and white crescents, blue seas and wings, but the land was a court and you were made guilty. When you become no more than a few words seeping through a pen or just another face in the papers, a story. When the weight of uncommitted sins rests on your shoulders, be angry. Be so angry that the world starts to shake under your footsteps. Do not be obedient. 
Be a sailing ship in the storm refusing to stay because you are wild and free like the wind, nowhere and everywhere, uncontrollable. For years they have tried to tame your ways, break your habits, cage you, domesticate you, convince you that you are fragile and flawed. But they have no power to change your ways. You who grows in darkness without sun or water. You who clawed your way out of the soil with charred fingers emerging as a wildflower. My mask accentuates on the hour, presenting the wonderful horrors of a new face. Some days I wear the tough ones, some days I wear gentle grace. It's as if I'm stuck on multiple personality disorder, my multiple faces arrive in order I ignore the broader implications of how tense my muscles are. My legs are grimacing, my sense of self is diminishing to something, someone, so perfect. And I will kill myself to make it appear so. Performance must be perfect, even though perfection is a myth. And you know this, I tell myself. But ambition is just another layer for false perfection. I could become the perfectly imperfect performer. But every day I still fight to be the perfect daughter, the perfect woman, the perfect artist, the perfect friend, the perfect poet. They call me the Empress of Calm. I sweep the floor at every interval. Because I am afraid that the audience will see in their peripheral vision the real, so incomplete and imperfect me. If they don't like it, they might leave again, you see? I remember the first time my show went horribly wrong, I told myself I wouldn't need them. I went to bed to reinvent myself and I, I emerged from the covers, my undercover gem. The bare, untouched me. Under the impression that I am finally showing my raw self, ignoring the compression of a mask that wears much heavier. The picture of who I wish to be is exhausting, in truthful honesty. The unlayered me emerges at night, in the shadows, as my mask bears the glory of light. Body language. I miss the physical act of writing. Ellipsis. The world has always made sense as soon as I have my notebook, comma, and I miss it with a belly wrenching insert dash before wrenching end of line, comma, well turned sideways insert dash after world insert dash after turn end of line, kind of hurt, full stop. There is no other part of my body I would notice missing more than my hands, comma. And now somehow I'm on an awkward first date in a long-term relationship, insert dash after long end of line, comma, and I've forgotten how to do it all, full stop. Do you find it off-putting? I think in punctuation because writing is like that for me. When I was small, I thought a writer had to have their hands on the thing to make it live. But I'm no potter shaping clay. I do not wax lyrical by candlelight or shape letters in the sand. I write with my hands in my lap and a headset to my mouth and I dig for nuts and bolts. I am constructing. This is what's left of one human being, this thing on a slip of gauze. Words are now just building blocks. They spill onto the page and I try to connect these dots. I am voiceless. I am panting for breath like a dog. I am failing to wrestle reality into submission with my words anymore. How can I be a writer if I cannot write? It's been years and I do not mind the pain so much anymore. But I hate 
that I cannot stroke his hair or spend hours exploring the map of his skin with my fingers connecting the dots, connecting with him, but we have found new ways to connect. There is a new body language. There must be a new body language to writing. I have a voice, full stop. I will make noise with it, full stop. Dig past the bones of the grave I made to writing, comma. Tell myself I will learn to clothe my words with flesh again, comma. Take those first flashes of thought and learn to tinker with them until I make a whole of them, comma. Declare I am not a prisoner of my body, but of my mind, full stop. I will not stop writing until the breath has gone from me, comma. Until the blood stops singing in my veins, comma. And if I must learn this all again, I will be grateful for this imperfect magic that has given me my voice back, comma. And I will take the shapeless awe of my longings and work them on the anvil until I have forged a better thing, comma. And I will write because I do not need to have my hands on it to give a soul to the pot, comma. Because it was never in the clay, comma. It was always in the potter, full stop. We, the unwanted masses, the children our colonizers underestimated, are here now, ready to pick up spears. We're Oedipus, ready to kill our father. The children our colonizers underestimated. We were forced into boats, made to fork our tongues from Yoruba to Patwan, so we became Oedipus, preparing to kill our father, rebelling against those who made us question marks on our great-grandchildren's family trees. We were forced into boats, made to fork our tongues from Yoruba to Patois, where our children left behind were forced into subjects and continued to rebel against those who distorted their family trees, stole their land, and then told them that their very discontent is a measure of their progress. Their children, left behind, forced themselves to make it in Britain. Lived, studied, got jobs, but it was never enough for landlords, universities and employers who measured them by their colour, not their progress. So they went back, warring under the legacy of Mau Mau, Ijemo and Amritsar and gained some independence. But it could never be enough. Instead of life in an unstable, nascent country, they sent their children back who lived, studied and got good jobs birthing British citizens, warring under the legacy of British jobs for British workers while keeping a hold on their history, which government tried to take in their operation legacy. Living, studying and holding jobs, we now, the unwanted great-grandchildren of empire, are British today, but we still keep a hold on our history. We fight for our operation legacy here and now, ready to take up spears against anyone who would force us to forget. Come sit down, take a seat. We know each other pretty well. It's been a decade I've grown up. Can't you tell? How about you and I have a good old reminisce? I've got a lot to say and ask, so answer me this. Did it give you satisfaction, storming into my life like that? Inflicting pain, destroying plans, pushing my career right back? Tell me, did it give you pleasure laying waste to my youth? Guess you like playing games and concealing the truth. You got people thinking I was lying, that I just craved the attention, no matter how hard I was trying. Your name wasn't getting a mention. I was doubted, judged, dismissed for what felt like forever. Desperate to be believed in the slightest measure. Years of medical gaslighting. Tiffany, it's all in your head. Anxiety, heightening, depression, frightening, thinking I was better off dead. And do you know what effect that can have on a person? Let me paint you a picture of how my mental health worsened. I wake up and wish that I could overdose, or better yet, just stick me in a comatose, because these illnesses, they got me on overload. Not long before I have a panic episode. Heart's racing 180, that's the BPM. Ain't getting no sleep, no REM. Body's shaking and I'm failing to see the end, because when it's chronic, face it, you ain't gonna mend. You don't grow up wanting to be sick when you're older. Did you forget I'm someone's friend, someone's sister, someone's daughter? I had plans for my future career and now it's come to this? Too ill to work? Living off benefits? 
But see, this is where the story gets exciting. You thought you'd won, you almost did, but I've come back fighting. See, there's a lot of great traits you have gifted me. Resilience, strength, the power to see true friendship, support among adversity. Hell, you even brought me closer to my family. I may still resent you, but the hatred is fading. Pain is lonely, that you've shown me, but this life I wouldn't trade in for another. Because you've made me strong, stronger than the other. Me would have been all along, and yes, I suffer every day and every hour. But you're part of me now, and I couldn't be prouder. See, despite your best efforts, the truth truth came out. Test scans, results eliminated the doubt. Doctors finally saw what I've been crying about. Treatment started, too many medications to count. It's about time I heard my well-deserved apology. At least now the doctors finally acknowledge me. Collecting conditions and consultants like commodities, rheumatology, cardiology, neurology. I've made my peace and accepted that you're here to stay. I'm a proud disabled woman each and every day. My future might look different but hasn't gone away. Now there's one last thing that I would like to say, dear chronic illness. No matter what, we're in this together. I want to thank you, but I'm going to need you to remember that you can take away my health and you can take away my time, but you can't take away my words. My words will forever be mine. Thanks so much for watching our BBC Words First Showcase. I'm Will and I'm um, joining you from New Arten North in Newcastle. Um, we've really so much enjoyed working with this group of poets during August. It's been a complete joy. I wanted to just say a couple of, of thank yous. So firstly, a huge thank you to Nadine Aisha Jasset, uh, who led our workshops. Nadine has inspired and engaged us and she's taken us into new frontiers of poetry and new ways of thinking about poems. Also to say thank you to my colleague Victoria for like her calmness and um, unwavering support. And thank you to our partners and collaborators, uh, Young Identity, Noiriki, Nine Arches Press, and Apples and Snakes. It's been lovely to work with you all. For making the programme possible, I want to say thank you to BBC One Extra, BBC Asian Network, and BBC Contains Strong Language. But really, I just want to finish by sending uh, just heaps and heaps of positivity to this group of poets. Your togetherness and your talent of what have made these sessions what they were. Uh, it's been a real wonder to, to spend this time with you. Um, and I just wish you all good fortune for your writing and for everything else as you go forward into the future. Uh, thank you for, so much for being with us. <laughs>